Thank you, Brother Dean. That was awesome. It's amazing how light sheds light on Scripture. Any of you remember the the author A. W. Pink? Have you ever read any of Pink? Do you know what his last words were to his wife on his deathbed? It's amazing. You'd think it would be something beautiful, you know, think of heaven. He said this as he was dying. The Scriptures explain themselves. They do. So, amen. Well, let's go back to Psalm 84. One verse is our text this morning. It's verse 11. And by the way, before I read it, there was one little nugget that I failed to even comment on. It's verse 3. The sparrow and the swallow. The sparrow... Remember Jesus said, uh, are not two sparrows sold for one penny? So a sparrow was worth half a, half a penny. The, the day is coming, if we come into times of famine, we might hunt a bunch of them and, and eat them. You know, that's pretty cheap meat. Uh, uh, a uh, swallow was just a wanderer. It was a flighty bird and wouldn't stay place long. Why does the psalmist mention in verse 3, sparrows and swallows, worthless and wandering birds that aren't important in the bigger scheme of things. He mentions them in the terms of the house of God, the temple. Notice what he says. Even the sparrow has found a house. And the swallow, a nest. Now, birds that nest, they're gonna, it's kind of a home in it. The, the flitting, active swallow even makes a home in the house. Where she may lay her young on your altars, O Lord. What's the point of saying this? Here's the point. Behold the fowls of the air. Are they, are you not of much more value than they? Answer yes. If God's creatures, the worthless, the wandering little creatures could find a place of home and security in the temple, how much more are you secure? I was... I came out of a restaurant a few months ago and on the ground, in the flower bed, was a dead bird. And it was a moment of worship for me. Because God was there. You know how I know God was there? What did Jesus say? Without your father. Not one of them can fall to the ground without your father. I made it a, I made it a worship service. Not a long one. But I met God there of how much more value are you than a sparrow. So if birds can find a home in the Old Covenant temple, guess what? How much more every saint of God, every Christian has, has a home in his Father's house. Alright. So, this morning, I'm going to speak from verse 11. Let's read it. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He gives, the Lord will give grace and glory. So God is two things. He gives two things. And then here's a promise. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. 
we'll pause. A father's love for a child in the house of God. No good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. Man. I'm speaking this morning on who God is and what He promises to give. This one verse. Let's unpack it. Let's milk it for all it's worth. Let's dig it. Let's eat it and, and meditate on it and appropriate it. So, um, before we do that, let's pray again. Our gracious Father and our God, here we come again as we have so many times perhaps over the last year for some, for some over decades. But here we are again on the Lord's Day as the house of God gathering to sit at Your feet and to hear Your voice, Lord Jesus. So we ask You to give us fresh manna. We ask You to feed us with the finest of the wheat even with the honey out of the rock of Christ. Speak, O Lord, as we come to You to receive the truth of Your Holy Word. And according to Luke eleven thirteen, give us Your Holy Spirit this morning to speak the very heart and words of our Good Shepherd And give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive. Speak, O Lord. We are the sheep of Thy pasture. In Jesus' name, Amen. Who God is and what He has promised to those who walk uprightly. You know, throughout the Scripture, God is revealed to us. In fact, the Bible is in essence, a written, perfect, inerrant record of who God is and what He's done for sinful men. The Bible is the only and exclusive place where God has shown man who He is and what He's done and what He will do. The Bible is the depository if you will, to reveal to us God's names, His purposes, His ways, His predestined plan for time and eternity, His will, and His person. And that is most that was progressively revealed in the Old Testament. You know what, what progressive revelation means that God began to reveal Himself in past times. Uh, Hebrews 1 says, God spoke uh, in times past by the prophets. That was progressive revelation. But has in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. And Jesus said that He was the revealer of the Father. And in the person and work of Jesus Christ, God is most clearly revealed. Perfectly revealed. He who has seen Me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. You're looking at God, Thomas. You're looking at Him. So, the Bible tells us about God. And here, verse 11 says, For the Lord God is... So we're talking about who God is. And then we'll get to, to um, what He gives. But who is God? He is our Creator. Remember the psalmist said, it is He who has made us and not we ourselves. He is our King and Lord of all. He is the Judge of all the earth. Look, His darkest themes seem to be in the, in the earth and they may get darker and, and harder. But look, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
He's going to. He's going to come down and wrap it up, mop the whole mess up, recreate the heavens and the earth, in which only will dwell what? Righteousness. That's a glorious reality that's coming. That summarizes my eschatology right there. Jesus wins. He's going to mop it up. And we will dwell forever with Him. He's the judge of all the earth. He's the sovereign of all the ages. He's the great I Am. He is, our God, is the eternal, uncreated One who dwells in unapproachable light. Light. He's the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. He is a consuming fire who lives, has lived forever before time, who lives outside of time and space. We can't even comprehend Him. We know little, very little about God. There's more that's true about Him than it's revealed in the Bible. Did you know that? You just chew on that one a little while. There is more there is to know about God than has been revealed even in the book of books. And we see through a glass house. Darkly. Kelsey and I had bad cataracts. We see more clearly now. But we don't see Him clearly yet. We see. But what we've seen and tasted, how good is it? Yeah. So, He is omnipotent. What does that mean? Unlimited. Absolutely unlimited in power. He is omniscient. What does that mean? Infinite, unlimited knowledge of everything. Think about the eternal decree of God. He decreed whatever would come to pass with one thought. You, and then He would save you. Every leaf that's ever fallen from every tree, anywhere, He decreed where and when it would fall. He decreed every sea creature and every movement of them forever in history. One thought. Omniscience. He is far beyond our highest thought. He's omnipresent. You know what that means. He's everywhere. Space. God doesn't exist in space. Space flew, uh, flowed out of Him. And he's beyond all space. He's everywhere perfectly, intimately, transcendent, and imminent. He's everywhere simultaneously, fully, all the time. He fills the universe and He's outside of it. So, stay with me. This is our God. He speaks and creates all the galaxies and the solar systems and every star. And he, the psalmist says, He created the stars and He named each one of them. They've discovered new galaxies in recent decades they didn't know existed before. My wife and I were on a, a road trip in this summer to see our son in California. And we, we spent the night in Yosemite. And then we came back to Sequoia National Park. And in, in Yosemite that night, we went outside. No cities around. The stars were awesome. It's like, it's like someone said yesterday, huh? it was Dean, it was one of us. When you first step to the edge of the Grand Canyon, speechless, you, you cannot take it in. And for God to create the multiple trillions and go beyond those numbers of the stars that exist, and He named every one of them, this is our God. This is your Father who cares for you. And in that psalm it says, He names the stars 
But in the same passage it said, He heals our scars. Now think about that. From out there, right down to your hurts and your wounds and your, the scars of sin and life's wounds, He is in the process of healing your scars. The One who named all the stars. This is our God. He's the Ancient of Days. He's the triune, eternal God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So I'm going to hurry on before I start dancing. And you know, the Apostle Paul exploded into worshipful, worshipful theological celebration. Remember when he said, Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's celebrating. Immortal, existing forever. Eternal, without beginning or end. Invisible, unable to be seen. You know, you hear people write books. Well, I, you know, I died and I saw Jesus and, and I, I, I came back and I've written a book and I was on Oprah and now I'm famous. I've seen... No. He's a liar. A, an absolute liar. No one has seen God. He dwells in unapproachable light. Anybody that would ever catch a glimpse in this physical flesh would be annihilated and burned up immediately. The glory, the glory of God revealed on Sinai, Moses feared and trembled and quaked. And he was an intimate with God. So, he is unable to be seen. He's concealed from all sight. And he's all that and much, much more. When you study the Bible, you read the Bible, don't look for yourself. Oh, what does this mean to me? You've heard that mentioned before. Look for God. Read it to know Him. Read it for you to soak in who He really is. And this is a progressive revelation. If you're a Christian 80 years, when you get ready to die, you will have only just begun to know what He's like. And He becomes all the more glorious to us the more we realize it. But aren't you thankful that this in one sense, unknowable God as to His person and His essence has become knowable. He chose in His kindness to reveal Himself to us or we wouldn't know Him. We were, we were fast bound in Egyptian night and couldn't see the way. Blind. Blind. Loving our chains of sin. And as Wesley said, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. We woke the dungeon flame with light. And we saw. You know Him now. You know Him. Because Jesus Christ has revealed who God is to this darkened, vile world. So let's get in let's get into this a little more. Who, who is Christ to us? Because Christ is the sun and the shield here. Who is Christ to us? He is our God. He is our prophet, our priest and our king. He's our redeemer. He's our sympathizing, understanding, tender-hearted High Priest, who has grace for us if we'll come in our time of need. He's our Good Shepherd. He's our Mediator between us and the Father. He's our Advocate. You know what your, the advocate word Advocate means? It's a Comforter and a Counselor and a Lawyer and a Heavenly Defense. Whenever you sin, whenever you blow it, the only, the only answer... The only thing God wants to say to us when we sin is, you have an advocate. I have an advocate. 
And when you sin, you don't wallow in self-pity. You don't beat yourself up. You don't think somehow you've got to earn forgiveness again. You go to the Gospel. Father, I sinned. And I have an Advocate in Heaven. Jesus Christ the righteous. The greatest tool to gain and keep assurance is Jesus Christ as your Advocate. Pleading in Heaven for you all the time. He's your Advocate. He's our Lord and our Master, our Elder Brother. He's a shelter in the time of storm. He's our friend, our comforter, our heavenly home builder. That's what He's doing. I'd be, I'd be joyful and I would speak in tongues if I had my mansion or my house or by you, any of you in heaven. He's our home builder. He's our sustainer and our keeper. He is our life and He is everything to us. That's who He is. But we're going to get to the text. Really, just these two statements. Very specifically, He's revealed here in verse 11 to be two things. Now, let me remind you, when the Bible says to you any place, God is this way, God is this, God is like that, that means the Bible is telling you right there that you need to believe that He is that for you in your life. Does that make sense? Appropriate it. When the Bible reveals something to you about who God is, believe that, that He means to be that to you. He wants you to believe that about Him. So here, what's He called? A sun and a shield. That's how the psalmist describes Him to us. And that's what we're to believe about Him in our journey in the ho- with the house of God in our pilgrimage. He's called a sun and a shield. Now in Psalm 84, He's also called the Lord of hosts in verse 1 and verse 8. He's also called the living God in verse 2. And He's called, he's called our King and our God in verse 3. And in verse 11, He is called the Lord God. But here's what the psalmist says the Lord God is to us. He's our sun and our shield. So let's, let's just meditate on those. First, He is your sun. S-U-N. He's your sun. This is it's just obvious what we get from this. The sun's out today and it gives what? Life to the earth. It gives light. By it we see all things. A match can light up in a measure a darkened room. A candle uh, back last February, we had a week in Texas that it was zero, zero degrees for seven days. And they had the rolling blackouts and, and we'd had some candles on before bedtime. And it, they, they lit up the room. One light. God is our light. He shines on us first To show us what? The light of the Gospel. He is our light. He's our sun. John Calvin said this, God is the light. He's the light of all who dwell in God's house. Jesus said, He who who believes in Me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. It is He who opened our blinded eyes. It is God, the Holy Spirit, who made us to see the glory of Christ when we were blind sinners. And remember what 2 Corinthians says. I love it. I love this. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined into our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Our hearts in darkness... The Spirit of God took the truth and He shined into our hearts and He brought us to life in regeneration. And suddenly, we, we saw for the first time the glory of God 
in the face of Christ. And we see the light as God is our light. And we're now in the light. We're children of light. And we're to walk in the light. Remember one of the plagues was a plague of darkness. And the Bible says it, it was a darkness that could be felt. <laughs> and that, that's, that's dark. I mean, it was supernatural dark. But what was happening in the tents of the Israelites? Every tent, the light. It was the presence of God. You talk about a power grid filling every tent. And they had to... Who knows what they felt? They knew out there pitch dark. But in, in the children of God under the Old Covenant, the believers who followed the tabernacle to worship the house of God in their tents, in their houses, full light. Full light. And that is us. The presence of God is our light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. This is so glorious. And you can, you can be sure, brothers and sisters, now that you're in the light, now that you're in the house as a dweller. Everybody decide to be a dweller yet? You're not sure? As a dweller, He will never leave you in darkness. You may go through the valley of the shadow, you may be facing dark times because dark is another word for uh, hardship and sorrow where it's cloudy spiritually and you can't see the sun. But Christ, your light, will never ever leave you there. He's going to lead you into the light. I've, I've, I've often thought and I've often said, however dark the skies are physically, right beyond that cloud cover, the sun is shining in its brightness. It hadn't changed. And however dark your cloud cover in life is, the Son of God is shining. He's there. You believe it, though you don't see it, though you don't feel it. Christ is your light through the darkness of the valley of the shadow of death. On the journey in the pilgrimage, as you go from strength to strength, God is your Son. He's your Son. Well, second thing, He is our shield. He's your Son. He's your shield. Now, you know what a shield's for. You, you picture it. You know what its purpose is. Think of this. The Lord said to Abram, Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. The God of Abraham is your God. He's your shield. And He's your exceeding great reward. Now translated, shield means just what we think. Protector. Defender. Jesus Christ is the only one who truly, 24-7, perfectly, has your back. You believe that? Is he's, have you seen that He's so trustworthy, you know it's true. And as you walk your whole journey, there's two fellas always behind you. You look back, surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. He is your shield. He's your protector and your defender. He's your keeper and your caregiver. My mother, adoptive mother, who took me in when my parents died by the time I was eight, she was my cousin. She raised me. And when she got too old to live on her own, alone, by herself alone, Lynn and I took her in. She took me in when I was two 
Turnabout's Fair Play, we took her in the last eight years of her life. And we were, Linda primarily was her caregiver. She was Linda's third grade school teacher. And Linda knew her all her life. And we became her caregiver because for 50 years, she died when I was 50. For 50, for 48 years, she was my caregiver. Who is your great caregiver? The Lord. He will never, ever fail you. He will carry you as your light into light more and more. The path of the righteous is as the shining sun, the shining light that grows brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. He's your, he is your shield, which means He's your mediator. He's always representing you before the Father. He's your propitiation. He shielded you from the wrath of God by taking it on Him. He's your righteousness. He's your justification. He's your advocate. What a shield we have, brethren. Would to God that we believed it more deeply and truly and always and didn't lose sight of it. There's a hymn I love. A sovereign protector I have. Unseen, yet forever I have unchangeably faithful to save, almighty to rule and command. If Thou art my shield and my sun, the night is no darkness to me, and fast as my moments roll on, they bring me but nearer to Thee. With the Lord, there is no difference between light and darkness, because He is our sun and our shield. Now let me hurry on to think more about this. Number two, what does He give? Well, I'm going to be brief on this. God is our sun and shield, but look in the verse. The Lord will give he, what He gives. He gives two things, grace and glory. I'm not going to labor the point of grace. You know that. You know it biblically. You know it experientially. You know in His pure mercy, he rescued you out of your sin. And you would be in hell now if He hadn't shown grace to you. And He's been giving you grace every day. Every day. Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. Grace to keep us. Grace to help us. Grace for all our needs. Grace to help in time of need. In all your days, you're going to partake of daily grace. You're going to live on it. Not works. Aren't you thank, thankful you don't have to merit anything before God? Wouldn't it have been a bondage to live under the law? You can't perform it. But we're not under the law. We're under grace. It's freedom to live for the One we know and love who is our Son and our shield and who daily loads us up with grace. And then glory. Glory. Grace is glory begun. It blossoms and buds into more glory. The glory of the sons of God is going to be manifested. He's going to lead us from glory to glory as we behold Christ. We've seen much more of His glory the more we've worshipped and, and been in His Word in the days of our pilgrimage. And Christ is becoming more and more glorious to us. To, to, to us who have not seen Him, He is precious. And we're going to share in His glory. We're going to reign with Him. We're going to rule with Him. We're going to judge angels. The glory that awaits us, no saint has ever known it until they get there. 
glory. He shows us and leads us into more of His glory, and we participate in it. And we will be glorified with Him. It's true. Now let me close by the last, the last phrase in the verse, which is a promise. This is what He's promised. Who He is, what He gives, and what He's promised. This is one of my favorite promises in the Bible. It's right up there toward the top. No good thing, nothing good, no good thing will He ever withhold from who? Those who walk uprightly. Those who dwell in the house. Those who live for their King. Not perfectly, but with purposely from your heart. You're endeavoring, endeavoring to live for your King and walk with Him. No good thing will He ever withhold from them. I talked to a lot of single people that longed to be married. And it hadn't happened yet. And they're lonely. And that's real. The primary thing I always share with them, if you're to be married, God's preparing that person right now for you. They're out there, and God's shaping them, and He's going to cause your paths providentially. You're heading toward each other, don't know it. Oh, I wish I were married. Heading toward each other. Oh, I don't know if God will... Oh, you're heading toward it. Boom! You meet. In church, at a conference. And He brings that person. Because no good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. If you're to be married and you're not married yet, wait on the Lord. Patiently. And He will cause you to inherit the land. Because God has promised no good thing withhold, He withhold. If you truly need something, He's not going to withhold it from you. And if He does, you don't need it. It's not good for you. Now, we don't judge it by what we think is good for us. Because some things we wouldn't think are good, He calls it to work for good. But no good thing will He withhold from those who walk uprightly. This is a promise. And we ought to live on it. I love feeding on the promises of God. Unto you, Peter says, have been given exceeding great and precious promises. Not just promises, but precious promises. Not just precious promises, but great and precious promises. Not just great and precious promises, but exceedingly great and precious promises. Do you feed on them? When you read them in the Bible, do you stop and pray them? They're there for us, not for information, but for appropriation. The promises of God are a signed, certified check for the believer. All the promises of God are what? Yes and amen. Signed in the blood of Jesus. And every one of them is for us to properly, biblically, possess. Oh, brethren, read them, know them, believe them, feed on them. Because the promises of God are fuel for faith. You can only believe God for what He's promised. I'm not believing God for an $800,000 house. Or a Maserati. I took a picture the other day of a Maserati in Texas driving. I sent it to my children and I said, maybe I should buy this for Linda for, for Christmas. They got a big laugh. I'm not believing God for that kind of stuff. That Maserati is going to be rotting in a junkyard, worthless, long after, well, after I'm gone, probably. <laughs> you see my point? We can only believe God for the things He's promised. But this is an exceeding broad field of promises. They're there for the, for the taking. And, and we must believe that they're for us. If 
we're walking uprightly. Meaning, walking in the Word. Walking in the church. The hymn says, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, light. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Enoch walked with God 300 years. He walked with God. You think he knew Him? Noah walked with God. Abraham, the friend of God. Christ walked with His Father. Now you walk with God. Those who walk uprightly. I'm asking you today to make verse 11 a life verse. Make Psalm 84 a life psalm. And live there. And taste and see that the Lord is good. And feast. Live in that field of Psalm 84. Be a dweller. Be by the Spirit of God the best believer dwelling in the house that God will make you. And you will possess and feast on your God as a son and as a shield and Christ as your loving caregiver because He will not withhold any good thing from you as a church or you as a saint that's good for you. Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's pray.